It's the NFL preseason. Check out the Ringer Fantasy Football Show on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, if you need fantasy rankings, we've got our rankings and sleepers at fantasyfootball.theringer.com. So come listen to Danny Heifetz, Craig Horlbeck, and me, Danny Kelly, on the Ringer Fantasy Football Show. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023, I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S, I-A-N dot com at Lassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. About a year ago, my wife and I were on vacation and we got a message telling us that a giant maple tree had fallen down at our house. I think it was a maple tree. I'm awful at remembering plant names. I really want to get better at it. I grew up in a small town in a pretty rural part of Oklahoma, but the plant identifying part of my brain is somehow a lifelong Upper East Sider. In my heart, I am a loving cultivator of Earth's marvelous flora, but my brain looks at a plant and goes, green, boring. Let's hop in a yellow cab and get lunch at Elaine's. Anyway, now Siobhan and I live in the middle of Pennsylvania. And last year, we went up to Maine for a few days, stayed at this totally lovely little place on the water, read some mystery novels, highly recommend it. Maine. It's the way life should be. And then at the end of our stay, Siobhan got a text from our dog sitter saying, a giant tree of some indeterminate species, probably maple, but really tall, could be a California redwood, who knows. But anyway, some giant tree, I'm paraphrasing if you couldn't tell, just toppled over beside your house. I think at the time we were sitting in a restaurant, like having cocktails, and our first thought was, hmm, a tree falling down in front of our house. Our house is really far away. That doesn't sound very real. And then the dog sitter texted us photos, and it was like, like an earthquake had just taken out the fucking hundred acre wood. It's dark, it's nighttime, and there's this huge thunderstorm raging, and then just this massive snapped off trunk and debris everywhere, and this fallen tree completely blocking the street by our house. Was it a maple? Now I'm second guessing myself. I feel like it rhymed with maple. I gotta get a plant book. We have these peonies in our backyard. I think they're peonies, sort of flowery, bushy things. And I never remember exactly what they're called. And every time I have to say the word, I have like a two-second panic attack. Like I'm trying to remember the launch code to stop a nuclear attack. I'm like... Why, yes, those are lovely flowers on the, oh, God, don't screw it up, don't screw it up, California red bush. So I assume this tree was hit by lightning. Not totally clear why it fell over. There was a storm. Obviously, trees are great at one thing, standing up, until they're not. I might only think lightning because it's so on brand for the show. Like everything in this podcast seems to get hit by lightning, including many of my metaphors. Anyway. 
Luckily, the maple tree did not smash any cars or crash headlong through our dining room ceiling. But it's still a problem when your tree is blocking both lanes of a two-lane road. The cops are going to be like, excuse me, sir, why are you stopping traffic with your tree? And I'm going to have to go because I'm too weak to move it. And also, I'm 600 miles away drinking French 75s at a sustainable seafood restaurant. No way am I saying that to a judge. So from this restaurant in Maine, we had to figure out how to get some dudes with chainsaws to go out and carve up the tree at like 9.30 at night. It is the most I have ever felt like a 19th century robber baron. I'm throwing down gin fizzes in literal Maine, like, ah ha ha ha, yes, distant laborers, toil on my behalf. Toil, I say. Mildly embarrassing, I guess, though not as embarrassing as that voice. But anyway, they got the tree dismantled and the road cleared by midnight, 1 a.m. And in the end, the whole thing, with the sidewalk repair and whatnot, only ended up costing us like $286 billion. I know, if you're a homeowner, you're going, wow, I assumed it would be at least $400 billion. And if you live in New York, you're like, Interesting, a hundred-year-old tree costs the same as seven minutes of my rent. So yeah, long story, tall tree, but I'm telling you this because I think this was the biggest incident I ever had where something from back home disrupted a holiday. Not really much of an incident. It's like a three on the Home Alone scale where one is, did I leave the TV on? And 10 is, did I leave my young child alone to wage guerrilla warfare against two middle-aged men in a van? Nevertheless, I bring it up because our story today begins with another holiday disruption. And this one, well, it's a doozy. It involves a considerably bigger change of plans than I experienced. It changes the course of soccer on an entire continent. And it also involves some giant ass trees falling to the ground. I'm Brian Phillips, by the way. Welcome to 22 Goals, the story of the World Cup. This is not a soccer podcast. This is the world's most random lumber company. In 1990, the Cameroonian striker Roger Milla turned 38. He'd been playing professional soccer for 20 years, and he was one of the most successful players in Cameroon's history. But he was now in his sunset years, soccer-wise, and that wasn't just how other people saw it, that was how he saw it. He'd spent most of his career playing in France, putting up good, if not mind-blowing numbers for a succession of good, if not world-beating teams. But now he'd left mainland France behind and was playing out the end of his career for a little team on the island of Réunion in the Indian Ocean, which he loved because the scenery was gorgeous and the competition wasn't too intense. It was like being on vacation. Roger Miller, not Miller, if you don't know him, it says Miller on his birth certificate, thanks to a clerical error, but his name is M-I-L-L-A, Milla, born in 1952 in Cameroon. Cameroon, if you can picture the continent of Africa, the shape of it, you know how there's a big bulge on the upper left in the northwest? And then if you go south a little ways, the bulge kind of tucks in. There's a bend in the coastline on the western side. Right in the middle of that bend is Cameroon. It's a medium-sized country, about 28 million people. It was colonized by the Germans in the 19th century. And that, to borrow a term from academic historians, was a fucking nightmare. So after World War I, the League of Nations, you know, the precursor to the UN, was like, we have to come up with a better solution. So they did the only thing a high-minded organization committed to the cause of justice 
could do in the 1910s, they arbitrarily divided Cameroon between the British Empire and the French Empire values. So part of the country speaks English, most of it speaks French. Cameroon achieved independence, finally, in the early 1960s, but the Francophone part and the Anglophone part are frequently at odds. Footnote 1, see colonialism. Now, take the Google Maps image you've got in your brain and scroll it to the southeast, right and down. You come to the east coast of Africa, and then you're out over the Indian Ocean. 250 miles of ocean, you come to the big island of Madagascar. Keep going, pass over 600 more miles of ocean, and then you come to Réunion, where Roger Milla is casually winding down his playing days. Réunion, incidentally, is legally part of France. It's part of the European Union, even though it's thousands of miles from the continent of Europe. What are you going to do? We've got Alaska. Footnote 2. See footnote 1. So, Mila is playing for this little club called J.S. saint pierre Waz. J.S.S.P. It's great. He's way better than everyone else. He's taking it easy. He's put on weight, plays a little tennis. Picture drinks with umbrellas, basically. He later said, to finish my career that way seemed idyllic. I would like to add that as a writer, I too wish to end my career that way, dominating like a small weekly grocery store newsletter in paradise. I could be the weather columnist. It's sunny in 72. I will take my paycheck in limes. Thanks. Mila spent, oh gosh, 15 years or so starring for the Cameroon men's national soccer team. He played in the 1982 World Cup in Spain, which was Cameroon's first ever World Cup. It's really hard in the 80s and early 90s for African teams to make the World Cup because FIFA, in its wisdom, only lets two teams from the whole continent play in the tournament, which is exactly the number of teams that usually play in the tournament from just the United Kingdom. So, Mila's been around, but he's retired now from international soccer. He's been retired for a couple of years. I don't know, 38 maybe doesn't seem that old for a player in 2022 in the LeBron slash Tom Brady slash Serena Williams slash horse placenta slash alkalizing Dragonberry era. Careers don't end the way they used to. That's a good thing. It used to be like, oh, hey, you're 32 now. Here's your cane and your hearing trumpet. Tell us a story, oh grandfather. So keep in mind that in 1990, 38 is a geriatric number for an athlete. If you're 38, you're Methuselah. Mila is done with international soccer. However... There's a problem. The problem is that Cameroon is going to the 1990 World Cup, and the team looks awful. People are stressing out. Soccer is huge in Cameroon. They're the defending Africa Cup of Nations champions. In 1990, though, they crash out of the Cup of Nations in the group stage. There's a lot of discontent. And people are like, hmm, remember when we had Roger Milla? He was good, right? The thing is, a few months earlier, at the end of 1989, he'd gone back to Douala, the biggest city in Cameroon, to play in an exhibition game. And he'd looked great. He scored two goals. Everybody had fun. An exhibition game is not the World Cup. Nevertheless, fast forward to 1990, and this is the moment when Mila's idyllic island life gets interrupted by a text from the dog sitter. Mr. Milla, a mighty tree of public opinion, has fallen on the street of your happy pseudo-retirement. The fans are clamoring for him to come back. Now, no one on the Cameroon national team wants him to come back. The players don't want him. The coaches don't want him. Cameroon has this new manager, a sort of gaunt, chilly-looking Russian dude, he doesn't want Mila. So Mila, personality-wise, how can I put this? He has a little bit of Larry Bird in him. 
Obviously, he likes having a good time. He's not playing in Réunion because he's a ruthless disciplinarian who hates pleasure. But on the pitch, when the stakes matter, he's a perfectionist. He's been the best player in Cameroon most of his life. He was born in 1952. He traveled around the country a lot during his childhood because his dad worked on the railroads, learned the game by playing barefoot with other kids on dirt roads, sometimes with an orange or a tin can for a ball. He was so good that people nicknamed him Pele. By the time he was a skinny 17-year-old, he was famous. So he's not known for being patient with his teammates. They also have a nickname for him. That nickname is Gaddafi. Yes, after the Libyan dictator, the other players would much prefer to go to Italy for the World Cup without their ancient, prickly, washed, demanding ex-striker. You know who did want him, though? Everyone else in Cameroon. So the president of the country, Paul Bia, who's still the president of Cameroon, by the way, issued a decree summoning him back to the national team. The president of the country signed a decree compelling the coach to call him up. Like, okay, you're at Disneyland. You're having the time of your life. You're three quarters of the way through Mr. Toad's wild ride. When your phone buzzes, it's a reporter from CNN informing you that Joe Biden has just delivered a nationally televised address from the Rose Garden demanding that you return to the Buffalo Wild Wings franchise you used to co-manage immediately. There is a question hanging over this episode like a Google Maps satellite over the Indian Ocean. The question is, who is the World Cup for? To whom does it belong? Easy answer, it's the world's tournament. It belongs to everyone. That answer doesn't work because it leaves out the ways in which the World Cup excludes people, in which the World Cup is designed to reward some people more than others. We talked about some of that when we talked about Kylian Mbappe and the World Cup in Russia in 2018, a few episodes back. If you're an oil billionaire, or a European media executive, or a building magnate in a host country, or a middle-class TV viewer in an affluent nation, for that matter, the World Cup is set up to benefit you more than to benefit, say, a railroad worker in Cameroon whose son plays soccer with makeshift balls in the street. But the cynical answer doesn't really work either. Because if you say, well, the whole thing is corrupt, the whole thing belongs to the cronies and the autocrats, then you're leaving out the excitement and the entertainment and the delight that people everywhere feel about the tournament. I can't speak, obviously, for any railroad workers in Cameroon, partly because I'm a white American writer in Pennsylvania, but mostly because it would violate the non-compete clause in my contract as the official spokesperson for railway workers in Denmark. But I would guess that soccer-loving railway workers in Cameroon might disagree that the World Cup doesn't belong to them. So it's a hard question to answer in a meaningful way. Who is the World Cup for? You sort of look at this tournament like it's a tree. You examine the bark, you examine the shape of the leaves, and then you go, uh, is it a speckled Arctic gooseberry bush? At the same time, it's a question that obviously matters a lot because the tournament is called the World Cup, not the corrupt Assholes Cup or even the rich Europeans and sometimes Pele Cup. The point is, in 1990, Roger Milla was approximately the last person the Men's World Cup seemed to be for, or at least the last professional male soccer player. He was African, and African teams struggled to be taken seriously at the World Cup. In 1990, no African team had ever made it to the quarterfinals of the tournament, and only one had ever reached the last 16. 
That, of course, was partly because so few African teams were allowed into the tournament, which created this whole stupid logical feedback loop where FIFA wouldn't give Africa more slots because African teams don't do well at the tournament, but African teams don't do so well at the tournament in part because they have so many fewer chances to try. Mila is also old, and the World Cup, at least on the pitch, is for young people. The World Cup is no country for old men. That's a line from a Yeats poem, and let me tell you, Yeats was a fine poet, but he would have gotten vaporized by a modern 4-3-3, so he clearly knew what he was talking about. Roger Milla flies out to join the Cameroon team. He's been called up by political fiat, essentially, and most of the team is not pleased about this. There are still a few players on the team who played with Milla during the 82 World Cup, but for the most part, it's a younger squad. Yates says that an old man's heart is sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal, and 24-year-old midfielders are like, yeah, well, you also suck at sports. Kids are not happy to see great-grandfather Gaddafi back with the team. And the worst part for Mila, they're right. He's out of shape. He's heavy. He's slow. He's labored. He looks like he's been playing country club tennis with, like, 64-year-old neurosurgeons named Jean-Philippe because, essentially, he has. He huffs and puffs. The kids are like, what's the matter, old man? Can't you keep up? Wow, it's so weird that you can't, given that you're twice our age and also we exercise regularly. But remember, the thing about Milla is that he's got that nasty streak, that Larry Bird streak. Think about, like, Larry Bird in the 80s. You basically could not say anything to Larry Bird in the 1980s because any comment you made, no matter how apparently innocuous, was apt to prompt Larry Bird to devote himself, body, and soul to proving you wrong and sapping your will to live. Oh, hey, Mr. Bird, your shoe's untied. Larry Bird spends the next eight months ruthlessly perfecting his shoe-tying technique. The next time he sees you, his shoe knots are flawless to a degree that psychologically devastates anyone else with feet. And then he just stands near you with his perfect knots, looking down at your suddenly humiliating normal knots. And you're like, gah! And he's like, that's what I thought. Mila gets to work. In other words, cue elaborate sports movie training montage. This is maybe the right place to mention that Cameroon's national soccer teams have arguably the coolest nicknames in the game. African teams in general have great nicknames. Basically, any African team's nickname is like three times better than every non-African team's nickname. I'm not kidding around. France's nickname is The Blues. Italy's nickname is The Blues. Meanwhile, Ghana is the Black Stars. Tunisia is the Eagles of Carthage. So much better. But Cameroon's is the best. Cameroon is the Indomitable Lions. Good lord, that's a cool nickname. The point is, in Cameroon nickname terms, the old Indomitable Lion is determined to show these Indomitable Cubs what's up. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This podcast is brought to you by AT&T Fiber with Allfy. 
Something tells me that the guy watching sports for 13 hours straight on Sunday, who then stays up watching the recaps of those 13 hours, then calls his friends to talk about it, is definitely going to notice that half a second delay. Get AT&T Fiber with All Fight and watch sports any time of day from anywhere in your house. Live like a gagillionaire. Limited availability in select areas. Go to att.com slash hypergig to check eligibility. Coverage may require extenders at additional charge. The 1990 Men's World Cup has kind of a bad reputation in retrospect. It's mostly deserved. The late 80s, early 90s was the peak of a few different trends in the game that really needed to be changed. And the tournament in Italy ended up being a turning point to some extent because it put those bad trends on full display for a billions-strong audience. Not a lot of goals, for one thing. 2.21 goals per game. Still a record low. That is a deeply disturbing statistic for the purposes of this podcast. It's a tournament of defensive setups. It's a tournament of tough fouls. It's a tournament, in short, of soccer balls flying every which way except into the backs of soccer nets. 1990. Also, a ton of diving at that World Cup. Let's be real. There's a ton of diving at every World Cup. You learn to live with it. But 1990 was special. Just a festival of fifth act opera deaths in the penalty area, including the singing in some cases. Actually, one of my favorite dives ever took place in this tournament. In the final, West Germany played Argentina, and the great West German striker Jürgen Klinsmann, a true artisan of just absolutely unrestrained, fake, on-pitch agony, gets taken down by the Argentine defender Pedro Monzon. Monzon gets a red card, and to cite the match announcer, it was a bad tackle. Oh, it's a terrible tackle by the substitute, Monzon. He's already been booked, and the referee has no hesitation in brandishing a straight red card. It's a deserved red card, probably, but watch the video and you see that Klinsman hits the ground and gives this, like, giant, full-bodied, writhing flop. Like, imagine a melodramatic fish being electrocuted. Here's my favorite YouTube comment on the video of this dive. Great liftoff, wonderful rotation, nice double somersault with Pike. Not his best dive, but should get some nines on the board. 1990 was also the peak of the hooliganism problem, or at least the peak of the global media's fascination with the hooliganism problem. This fascination was mostly concentrated on English fans and their reputation for semi-organized violence. There were some good reasons for this. We'll get into it another time. For now, just know that the impression many people had in 1990 was that if you had to play England— English fans in Burberry jackets were going to show up in droves looking to beat the shit out of random passersby. Sort of like the British approach to the global economy circa 1750. Anyway, ahead of the 1990 World Cup, the British sports minister visited the Italian authorities and was like, yeah, man, I don't know what to tell you. It's not great. So England ended up having to play all its group matches in a kind of quarantine situation on the island of Sardinia, where there was still a fair amount of brawling and rock throwing and fighting with the police. It could probably be worse, but I don't see how. Cameroon plays its first match in Group B, not on English Fight Club Island, but at the San Siro, the storied stadium in Milan. Bad news, they are drawn against Argentina. Argentina, the defending champions. Argentina, the team captained by Diego Maradona. 
before the match, the Cameroonian players had to endure a bunch of just gruesomely racist questions from European reporters who wanted to know, basically, whether they ate monkeys and brought a witch doctor with them to Italy. And I know this because the Cameroonian player Francois Oman Biyik said after the match, we hate it when European reporters ask us if we eat monkeys and have a witch doctor. Incredibly, Cameroon upsets Argentina, wins 1-0. Admittedly, they do this largely by kicking the living crap out of Argentina. A lot of hard fouls. Two indomitable Lions get sent off. Cameroon finishes with nine men. But they stop Maradona and ride out the win on the back of Omambi Yik's 67th minute goal. Unreal. Roger Milla comes off the bench for the last 10 or so minutes of the game. And honestly, for a 38-year-old to hold the fort for the final 10% of one of the all-time World Cup upsets would be impressive enough. But Milla and Cameroon are just getting started. Group B, game number two, Indomitable Lions of Cameroon versus Romania at the Stadio San Nicola in Bari. What's Romania's nickname? Let's look it up. Oh, it's the Tricolors. <sighs> I just don't know why it's so hard. People, why don't you just pick the coolest animal in your geographical territory and add a kick-ass adjective to it? Romania's national animal is the lynx? Why are you not playing as the unsurpassable lynxes? Alternately, you could name yourself after literally any tree and leave me completely unable to ID your team on television. Roger Milla starts the game on the bench. He starts every game on the bench. This time, however, he's sent in a little earlier. He comes on in the 59th minute. Match is scoreless. 12 minutes before the end of the game, still 0-0. Romania has probably been the better team overall, but it's been tight. The Cameroonian defender, Jules Onana, plays a long, high pass, a 70-yard pass toward Milla. Not the type of pass you can be overly precise with, and it ends up dropping closer to the Romanian defender, Ioan Andone. Ioan Andone, pretty good defender in his era, was banned for a year in 1988-89 for this incident in the 88 Romania Cup final in which he apparently dropped his shorts and waved his genitals derisively at the son of the Romanian dictator Nicolae Ceausescu? What? Did that really happen? I can't find video evidence, for which... I'm profoundly grateful, but Andone played for Dynamo Bucharest, whose big rival is a club called Stoa. Valentin Ceausescu, the dictator's son, was the president of Stoa. Numerous sources say that the match ended controversially and Stoa was named the winner. If your president is the son of the dictator, you tend to get the calls. Ceausescu denies this. I have no idea. That's what people say. And in protest, Andone dropped his shorts and waggled his maple tree at Ceausescu Jr.'s box. How far are you prepared to go for justice? Long ban from the Ceausescus for doing that. Apparently, you can be a dictator and still be a dick hater. Your dad texted me that joke. Probably worth it. For Andone, I feel like you either dine out on that story proudly for the rest of your life, or you pray everyone forgets about it and never mention it again. Anyway. The ball drops right in front of him, but Milla's closing down fast. And the thing about 70-yard passes is that they have a funny tendency to bounce. Ball hits the ground, boings up about 15 feet in the air. Call it the boing of destiny. Milla uses the time the ball's in the air to catch up to Andone. 
They're at the edge of the area toward the right side. Andone jumps and Mila jumps, but Andone jumps straight up. Mila, who's been sprinting forward, is still moving forward in the air. And that momentum allows him to knock Andone off balance, control the ball somewhat with his chest, and knock it into the center of the area. Andone goes down. Mila hits the ground and almost falls over too. He staggers, his arms windmill. He's about a quarter of an inch from face planting. But he catches himself. He springs up. The ball is now in the area a couple of steps away. Another Romanian defender is breathing down his neck. The goalkeeper's rushing out. He gets to the ball. He smashes the shot. Boom. Back of the net, one nil to Cameroon, one billion nil to Africa so far in this World Cup. And now, having scored the goal, Mila does something that becomes almost as legendary as the goal itself. He runs to the corner flag and does a little dance. Yeats once wrote in a poem about old age, 70 years have I lived, 70 years man and boy, and never have I danced for joy. Mill is like, fuck that. He dances for joy in full view of the TV cameras and everyone watching. The dance he does, I'm not going to describe it. Go look up the video. It's mildly suggestive, I think it's fair to say. It involves standing close to the corner flag and sensuously kind of slaloming his hips. There are people who say it's a Makosa dance, a kind of popular dance in Cameroon, but Mila says no, he just made it up on the spot. There's a really funny Washington Post profile of him written after this match. The reporter goes up to his room, he's packing because Cameroon have advanced in the tournament, they're moving to a different hotel, and Mila answers the door naked, and he's like, yeah, come in and ask me about my dance. And he says, in Cameroon, we dance like that. We use the butt. Now, obviously, I have no claim on Cameroonian dance culture. I barely have a claim on Danish railway worker dance culture. But if I could just gently request to have that line inscribed upon my tombstone, maybe in a small font in the corner, like, here lies Brian Phillips, loving husband, son, and internationally revered soccer podcaster, and then some tasteful blank space. And then we use the butt in like a classy engraved cursive script. It would be my honor to have it there. The goal is an immediate global sensation. The dance is an immediate global sensation. It becomes even more of a sensation when Mila scores again 10 minutes later, this time with a driving right-footed shot from a tight angle in the area, and does the dance again. Is there shimmying? There's shimmying. Holy shit, Cameroon is gonna win this. Cameroon does win this, 2-1 in the end. Cameroon's in first place in Group B. Cameroon celebrates. According to Sports Illustrated, the team dietitian lifts the ban on ice cream, whereupon midfielder Surreal Makanaki proceeded to scarf down a pound of the stuff. When they lose 4-0 to the USSR in their last group game, Francois Omambi Yik says, we weren't ready for the Soviet match. We were drunk, drunk, drunk. <laughs> Makes no difference. They finish with the worst goal differential in Group B and still win the group. They play Colombia in the round of 16. What's Colombia's nickname? It's the coffee growers. Okay, that's vivid. But wait. Oh my God, they're also called the tricolors. What? The national animal of Colombia is the condor. I weep for humanity. Also for condor anity. 
Roger Milla comes on in the 54th minute, match is tied 0-0 at full time. Guess what happens in extra time? Roger Milla scores twice, two goals in two minutes, two dances, also in two minutes. He's already the oldest man ever to score in a World Cup, and he keeps breaking his own record because that's how time works. Quarterfinals. First time an African team has ever made it this far in the tournament. Cameroon is drawn against, do you know, care to hazard a wild guess? That's right, England, the country with the wildest and most hazardous fans in the tournament. Okay, okay, okay. In fairness, I will grudgingly acknowledge that the vast majority of England fans in 1990 were not that wild or hazardous. Minimal hazardousness from most English supporters in Italy. It's the hazardous minority that ruins it for everyone else. The Cameroon match is played in Naples, a city where I personally would think carefully about whether to attack random strangers and it goes off without any major outbreaks of violence. In training before the match, Milla gets so intense that the other Cameroon players can't help but laugh at him. He runs around yelling, play like it was the real thing. Kickoff. Milla comes on after halftime. He wins a penalty, which Emmanuel Kunde converts. He sets up a goal for Eugène Ekeke. Cameroon is beating England 2-1. Thanks to Milla, the semifinals are in reach. They've felled some big trees already, Argentina, Colombia, and with 10 minutes left in the match, they've just about chopped down another. But then, in the 83rd minute, Gary Lineker wins a penalty. Gary Lineker converts it. Extra time. In extra time, Gary Lineker wins a penalty. Gary Lineker converts it. Two penalties in 22 minutes. Welcome to 22 Minutes, the story of the World Cup. Unfortunately, Milla and the Indomitable Lions fall out of the tournament, but not before they've captured the world's imagination. Milla's super sub heroics and his dancing are one of the indelible images, one of the joyfully indelible images of a tournament that didn't produce all that many of them. They're out, but not before they've made a point about the potential of African soccer and its right to be taken seriously on the world stage. As Oman Biyik had said after the Argentina win, after fielding all those racist questions about witch doctors, we are real football players, and we proved this tonight. Remember the question we asked a little while ago, the Google Maps satellite question? The question is, who is the World Cup for? Who does it belong to? For a few nights in the summer of 1990, it belonged unequivocally to a 38-year-old Cameroonian who wasn't even supposed to play in the tournament. And it was for fans in Cameroon and fans in Africa and any fans who were able to share in the pure happiness of Roger Milla's dance. FIFA didn't plan it that way, and the big soccer countries didn't want it that way. But one of the wonderful things about the World Cup is that the people who run the tournament aren't always the ones who write the story. And four years later, in 1994, soccer's sphere of belonging, its sphere of inclusion, expanded just a little bit on the basis mostly of Cameroon's run to the quarterfinals. Africa was granted a third team in the tournament. When the World Cup kicks off this year in Qatar, there will be five African teams in the field. Roger Milla kept playing longer than he ever intended to. And why wouldn't you if you were a hero to almost everyone who saw you play? He went to the next World Cup in the United States in 94. Cameroon didn't do as well in that tournament. They got knocked out in the group stage. 
But Milla came on as a substitute in the Lions match against Russia. And one minute after entering the game, as a 42-year-old, he got the ball in the middle of the area. He fought by two defenders and scored a goal, breaking his own record as the oldest player to score in the tournament. Everyone on Earth is getting older every second. And so you'd think Milla's record might have been broken by now. But it's been almost 20 years, and the record still stands. All the old soccer players in the world, and none of them have done what he did. And few players of any age have done anything to bring the world so much joy. There's no simple answer to the question, who does the World Cup belong to? Except this one. It always belongs to a player who can do that. This is 22 Goals, the story of the World Cup, written by me, Brian Phillips, The executive producers of 22 Goals are Chris Ryan, Juliet Littman, and Sean Fennessy. Our story editor is Connor Nevins, and the show was produced by Devin Rinaldo, Mike Wargon, and Vikram Patel. Copy editing by Jacqueline Cantor. Fact-checking by Kellen B. Coates. Thanks to Kellen for pointing out that the correct term is maple and not magical syrup forest god. The sound design in this episode is by Devin Rinaldo, who also composed the theme song and many of the music tracks. Some of the other music you heard in this episode is from Blue Dot Sessions. Additional mixing by Scott Somerville, art direction and illustration by David Shoemaker. The announcer audio in this episode is from FIFA. Thanks for listening. I'm reporting live from the annual Congress of the Danish Railway Workers Alliance, where I've just listened to the keynote address delivered by DRWA Secretary General Hans Larsen Christensen. I am now prepared to bring you an exclusive translation of Christensen's speech. It goes, quote, everything is fine. All the trains in Denmark are doing fine, pretty much. No problems. It's like the old saying goes, if you want adventure, don't necessarily join the Danish Railway Workers Alliance.